Hello, welcome to the Palladium Podcast. I'm your host, Wolf Tyvee. Today, I'm joined by one of our writers, Samo Buria. Samo has recently written an article for us about the centralizing effects of the internet and sen- and censorship in particular. Welcome, Samo. Uh, thank you, Wolf. It's good to be on the show again. Yeah, yeah, we've had you before, I think, for your uh, Botswana article. That was a great one. So in this latest article, you argue... Uh, on the heels of Twitter censoring the New York Post over uh, some Biden corruption article, that the internet inherently contains the potentiality for centralized discourse control. And in particular, I think one of the great arguments that you made in that article was that the internet tends to make lots of data legible and accessible, and it records a lot of data and then makes it legible and accessible. And then the result of that is that larger entities are more able to take advantage of that to exercise power on society than the individual user is able to take advantage of that. And thus, therefore, the Internet has this centralizing effect. I think your argument is much wider than that, but I thought that was a very sharp uh, statement of it uh, that was quite good. So, Samo, if you want to flesh out your argument a bit here just to get us started and then we can go into kind of what what do we want to do about this how do we want to respond to as a society to this this uh the nature of the internet and the nature of technology well first it's good to acknowledge that uh the narrative about the internet over the last 30 years has been the opposite right people have been saying that it's going to be a decentralizing force And every step of the way, decentralization seems to be promised right behind the corner, right? Right, Um, right. It's always next year. It's always next year. It's always like, oh, this isn't, you know, this is an anomaly of the way search engines work. Oh, this is an anomaly of the way social media works. Or, um, you know, oh, this is just a sign that the incumbent companies are particularly bad. Uh, And I think it's, it's nothing, it's nothing of the type. Uh, there was mm-hmm. this very important, you know, essay written back in 1996 uh, called, like, you know, quite quite um, ambitiously, a declaration of the independence of cyberspace. It was written by, you know, the yeah, poet right and activist John Perry Barlow. And part of the argument he makes there is, you know, it's quite interesting argument that um, that all of these concepts like property, expression, identity, movement, law, they're all based on matter and that there's no matter in the internet. Well, you know, people talk about the world of bits and the world of atoms. I think the basic fact is the bits were always implemented on the atoms. This means the atoms can know what is up with the bits, right? Just because we have mathematically good encryption, if it's, you know, not adopted, right? So if you have encryption, you can mathematically show that it's not supposed to be breakable, yet it's on a phone manufactured in China or in the United States for that matter, and those governments mandate backdoors, well, I'm sorry, you know, then your communication very much is is open to inspection. So this is kind of the like, the cypherpunk argument was that yes, um, the internet could be used to gather information about you. Yes, the internet meshes together what were previously like these different communication channels into a single one. But the good news is you can stay anonymous. The reality in the internet of 2020 is that if someone is interested in you, you know, be it, you know, an intelligence agency, but honestly, even like, you know, a journalist, right? Uh, you don't have anonymity. Yeah, right? Even anonymity, a motivated stalker. It, well, yeah, unfortunately, right? Like there are many people who have uh, serious issues with that. Arguably, our law is not properly adopted to deal with uh, with online stalkers and harassers and all of that classic stuff. But the logic of the technology is, I think it's a communication technology, right? And you can even argue that it's mm-hmm. a surveillance technology. So if it's a surveillance technology and organizations can gather information about individuals, say Facebook might collect uh, information that's relevant to figuring out what you might purchase, like ad stuff. It might collect political information about you uh, from your behavior. Uh, there might be metadata collected by, again, uh, security agencies, intelligence agencies, foreign governments. And at the end of the day, none of these organizations are made transparent to you, the user, via the internet, right? right? Like with the exception of the occasional hacker, 
you know, occasional hacker kid gets into the NSA computer or whatever, maybe gets offered a job, maybe gets put in a small box somewhere and never discussed again. You know, you never know. That yeah. is not enough to change the balance of power. Like ultimately, right. if we think about China, no one believes that Chinese hackers are going to bring down the Chinese Communist Party, even when they're discussing, uh, say, a propaganda or surveillance state that uses the internet. Yeah. Um, so, well, it, I, hmm. it's interesting you call it a surveillance technology. I mean, people might not sort of have personal experience with how the internet is a surveillance technology, or they might not know that they have personal experience. But let's think about what Google is. Google goes around and crawls everything and indexes everything. It creates a big map of everything and then allows you to search through that ar that giant archive in a sort of uh, meaningful manner. In, in other words, Google is a surveillance technology. It's a surveillance system that's open to the public. Anyone can use it, but it's essentially for surveilling what's going on on the web, right? And um, so this is, I mean, it's kind of a funny way to put it, but I think the, the fact that things like search engines are so possible in the digital realm is a good illustration of what you mean by the internet as a surveillance technology. Because especially if you have access to more data than Google has, you know, maybe you're the NSA or something, the, you know, the NSA is going to have its own internal search engines over that data that uh, that make it possible to surveil this enormous quantity of data that covers basically everything. Of course, people might quibble that a search engine is distinct from the internet, but these honestly are just quibbles, right? In 2020, an internet connection comes uh, attached to a camera and a microphone. The camera and the microphone are either on your laptop or they are in your phone. Uh, they did right. a study from about like, I think 2010, uh, where, you know, the typical Japanese cell phone user was, you know, 95% of the time, they were not more than uh, five meters away from their phone, right? So it's also a location tracker. Um, yeah. And so, so in 2020, you, the internet connection comes attached to, you know, a microphone, a camera, and of course, search engines are ubiquitous, as are other methods of analyzing data at scale. This data is most useful statistically. So arguably, you know, it's more useful to know what a million users are doing than to track minutely what one user is doing. But still, if right. someone really wanted to know what one internet user is doing, it's, it's become very easy yeah. uh, to get to that. Now you could you object. Have a shocking amount of data. Mm -hmm. Now you could object that if you're very careful, very technically savvy, use all the right equipment, then it's still really hard to piece that together. And I'm, uh, you know, I think to myself, all of this time, you know, all of this time you've invested into trying to make yourself untraceable, uh, you really don't have any time to do anything that would make you worth tracing, right? So it's it's a real barrier to entry, right? And it's it's not. Mm -hmm. In some sense, like if you don't like modern civilized life, you can go live in the woods and yeah, you're not going to be subject to the constraints of modern civilized life. On the other hand, you're not interacting with the rest of the people where they're actually connected, what, how people actually operate. And it's a similar thing with the internet. You can sort of opt out of a lot of these surveillance technologies by changing your habits. But a lot of those involve essentially unplugging from ways of interacting that in increasingly uh, form the, the sort of very backbone of our society. Well, you're choosing political and economic irrelevance, right? The, uh, you know, the strategy of go live in a hut disconnected from the world. I mean, I, I think, you know, w what is it? Um, there are a few romantic authors, I think. I think uh, you're a fan of a few who've done this. Yeah, Thoreau. Thoreau and on one extreme, you, you know, Thoreau, Thoreau and say the Unabomber are about as <laughs> right. advanced as you can get in influencing society from a hut. And arguably, right. it's not zero. It's certainly something. I hear both of them quoted in me like quite often and they're good. They're good writers. The manifesto is good, you know, um, but it it's not, it doesn't alter the reality of the society we live in. Right. It really doesn't. It's not just another voice at most. But to go a little bit back to, okay, so it's a technology of surveillance, de facto, at least packed with smartphones, packed with mm -hmm. devices that are in their physical design, in the atoms, right? Right. The atoms have to 
the bits, you know, maybe open source communities could dream those up, but the atoms, they have to be put together in a factory. And, you know, that factory is in someone's sovereign domain. So mm -hmm. on insecure hardware, we have microphones, cameras, you know, GPS, and we have your internet connection. So you can be surveilled. The information can be processed. What would happen if you try to use statistical methods to say, analyze, you know, a singular organization? like again, the NSA or even Google, right? I, I think really like, you know, everyone knows of WikiLeaks, right? And the, mm -hmm. the uh, famous Julian Assange associated with WikiLeaks. Well, WikiLeaks only released some number of emails from the State Department and other organizations. For us to have a realistic picture of what's happening inside of Google, there would have to be weekly leaks and there would have to be right. dozens of analysts pouring through it. Are we imagining a WikiLeaks organization for every powerful company, a federal bureau, political party? No, not really. But you can't imagine a data analyst looking at voters, consumers, or political opponents for each organization. So the asymmetry works really strongly towards making uh, the user more transparent, and it does not make the administrator more transparent at all. So straightforwardly, the power differential then pushes towards the administrator over time and whoever happens to be that administrator, right? Like it really doesn't matter yeah. if it's if it's technically a private company or if it's a government body or whatever. I would certainly trust the Estonian government with my private information uh, much more than I would trust Facebook. And of course, you know, I've traveled to Estonia and I use Facebook, right? There are sometimes the good uh, a service provides out, outweighs the cost. So we talked a little bit about the surveillance side here. There's also the control side as, as things naturally tend to concentrate on the internet, you, you tend to get these big monopolies. You get Facebook and you get Twitter and you get Google and they, they monopolize some aspect of how people interact with information and how people interact with other people. And as you centralize those things, you get also now suddenly a whole bunch of editorial control over the content of that central repository. So now we see in all three cases, Google does a little bit of it or quite a bit of editorial work on its search results, making sure that the, the results you get are the results you're supposed to see and that they want you to see and not uh, not necessarily just some something random or or the improper results and on facebook they make sure that the right articles go viral and the wrong ones don't go viral on twitter they and, and let's be let's be very clear here we're not even positing any sort of um i don't think you're positing any sort of negative or sinister or controlling intent it's just the fact that if google was not constantly tweaking um what kind of things are brought atop of the search engine, people would in fact learn to game the search results, right? So it's actually, well, it has they, to be I dynamically maintained. I mean, they, 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 they people do learn do, to game the search they results. They do, and, but and then Google's, the formula has also changed in response to that is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Google's quality has declined over time to some degree due to like SEO spam, right? Like where people mm -hmm. are able to create these websites that get highly ranked, but actually you don't really care about. Um, or maybe some, or maybe most people care about them, but, but I don't. Uh, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I don't know exactly what it is there, but but I think it's it's like yeah, you're right. It doesn't have to involve a lot of strict intent, even on the on the sort of sort of more editorial political angle. All it has to be is people are going to complain or see problems in the results that the thing is giving, and they're going to tweak the algorithm to solve those problems. And sometimes the problems are, hey, why is this stuff, why is this conspiracy theory stuff constantly getting so highly ranked? This isn't a reputable data. This isn't reputable sources. We should be penalizing this because actually the user wants to see reputable data. And that this, this might be the thought process. On the other hand, I think that actually there is a lot of uh, intentional approach to the thing. As soon as you have this power lying around, this power of editorial control over public discourse and and the information available to the public, someone's going to want to use that information. And it's just not the case that everyone is totally, you know, innocent in their approach to everything. People, people 
can and do come up with ideas like, hey, let's get this removed from Google so that people can't see it anymore to damage that set of ideas or that community. And you hear this all the time in people like in people having these these political discussions. They think, oh, I wish we could get this removed. Or I wish we could get that updated. And and so that I think there is definitely explicit intent involved in this thing because you know as soon as you have this power, people are going to start talking about how to use it. And I, I think I think one of the one of the fallacies that people have about this is that if there's no intent, it's okay. I think if there's no intent, it's worse mm. because you're you're doing something badly. You're doing something unconsciously, and 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 ha- you're doing it in a half baked manner. If you're not doing it intentionally, I think the intentional stuff is is in some ways it's actually better that someone is actually thinking about the problem of how do we how do we control the flows of information. They're thinking about it at least explicitly. Perhaps they're thinking about it in a hyper-partisan way, but it, they're thinking about it explicitly. First, you have to establish that control of information is a good thing or that information regulation is a good thing. Uh, there are right. lots of so people who would say that. that it's never it's never the case, but I think, it's, um, I think it is very obvious that with no limits on information, there are certain kinds of competition that just break the fundamentals of what makes for a good society. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I am very, very happy that my, you know, uh, I've used iPhones, but I've grown, you know, like a hipster to dislike iPhones and buy, buy Androids. Um, my Android blocks away suspected spam calls without me even ever having known it's a spam call. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, uh, if it didn't do that, my phone is strictly less useful. I'm bothered by right. calls I didn't want. The same goes for a classical spam folder in an inbox. That is already information control. Now yeah. you might say that you know this is like you know driven by the user's demand. Okay, okay. So yeah, let's look it's, beyond. It's on behalf of the user. L- let's look beyond the user. Uh, when you have a government that is locked in a geopolitical struggle with another government, do they allow each other's media free reign within each other's territory? I think the answer is no. They they never do. Right during World War One. Obviously, you know, the British press is censored, Uh, you know, there's not, you know, German newspapers aren't sold and so on. Obviously, you know, during the Cold War, I can't watch American TV in Moscow. And obviously now, uh, you know, in the very near future, you know, I might not be able to use a Chinese app in the United States. And I obviously can't read all newspapers from the US. And usually this is seen as like, oh, you know, only authoritarian regimes uh, want to censor and keep things away from their own population. Um, but the reality is, I think people have not looked at it from the perspective of the censor. What is the story the censor tells themselves every morning when they go to work? And it's often a true story. The story they tell themselves is, we are preventing disinformation. We're preventing the spread of incorrect, false, and misleading information that is intentionally weaponized and blasted at us. Now, let's remember Voice of America is a US-backed organization. So when the Soviet Union tries, you know, US government, it's just government money. It's a government object. Uh, So when the Soviet government was blocking that, I mean, in a way, you know, they were shielding stuff from their citizens and all of that. But in a straightforward way, that is, you know, by, you know, by definition, it's American propaganda, right? We, 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 we tend to think it's good, right? But, but say, what if Russian, what if Russian material or Russian stories are squashed in the West right now? Like I could easily see now as the election is coming, some website just deciding to block RT and that it is in fact not possible to link Russia today stories, uh, from, yeah, well, well, from Facebook Twitter or Twitter. Is- Twitter has made the first move in this by labeling state affiliated media um, so that I, I don't know where that will go, but they are at least calling it out now. They're calling out foreign state affiliated media. They are, of course, not calling out domestic state. Affiliated so so media. if I go to Voice of America's Twitter, it doesn't say uh, American state affiliated media. It just says Voice of America. Right. Yeah. So I, I think an interesting thing here is America has been culturally dominant for a long time in that we have the best propaganda and our propaganda tends to beat other systems of propaganda. So our incentive 
speaking from the, the perspective of the state, has been geopolitically to, to break down the information barriers of other states. And so we call them nasty names when they try to re- erect their information barriers to our propaganda, because that actually is a big vector of our power um, uh, over, over the rest of the world, is that they all, uh, you know, as Ramstein says, we all live in America, right? Right, right. Culturally speaking. I think it's hard to see from within America the nature of the issue because America is on top. Sort of, it, it's the old argument, you know, when you're on top in some system, you are very prone to think that that system is fair and balanced and totally reasonable and that there's no possible objection to it. I mean, it's, it's the old privilege argument, right? Like if you are on, if you're on top of society, you are not going to see the unfairness baked into and and the the partisanship baked into the very structure of the the system of competition and you're especially like you're not going to see the moves made on the structure of competition that systematically uh benefit you and you're also just going to make excuses and and uh believe that the thing is good and I think this same same thing happens applies with respect to America and free speech around the world. That this idea of open flows of information has been something that America has known how to dominate for a long time, and so we've already we've always seen it ideologically as a good thing. But it's actually just kind of a a historical contingent that that we are the best at propaganda, and therefore we want uh, the free flowing of propaganda. Now, somewhat recently, I think the American state has started to worry a little bit more about this. You see the military coming up with these initiatives, trying to help the, the citizens understand how to respond to foreign information threats. And we see things like, I mean, the Russia hoax uh, around, around you know, accusing Donald Trump of, of being an agent of Russia or whatever. That was indicative of a kind of thinking that I think was false in that case. But, but that there is that threat that that we might have that we might have manipulation coming from RT or from Russian bots or whatever, where other states might actually be able to negatively influence our discourse, and and that idea is coming back towards the front now, and we're starting to have more discussions of what's the right way to do censorship because of that. Just just a brief commentary on the Russia situation. As far as I know, the main um, the main statement there was that Russian intelligence allegedly had a hand in the acquisition of emails from the Hillary Clinton campaign and leaking those to the public. Uh, In other words, you know, the the Russian government is accused of having engaged in heinous and unprovoked acts of journalism uh, against the Democratic Party, right? Like, let's remember when you read in a U.S. newspaper, and by the way, I'm very happy, you know, to say something positive, to say something very positive about the New York Times. I'm happy that discussion, more discussion is being made of the plight of the Uyghur in China. However, yeah. note the initial batch of documents, uh, this was, I think, in February or March uh, that the New York Times wrote, you know, used to write their story. OK, so what is the what is Occam's razor for where those documents came from? Does the New York Times have thousands of informants all over the Chinese government? No, no, it's a it's a it was U.S. intelligence, right? And, uh, you know, if documents are acquired by an intelligence agency and when it's, you know, leaked by an unnamed source in Western intelligence, okay, that's a press release. So governments have always played this game quite seriously, which is, you know, a brief is written and then it's transmitted by a seemingly independent source or a source that claims to be independent. Uh, information is sometimes released, other times not released to, you know, hurt your rivals internationally or to prepare, you know, your domestic population for a longer term conflict with the enemy. So we're getting we're getting to sort of the first big justification for discourse control uh, in general and censorship in particular, which is there is competition between states and between societies. And that competition sometimes takes the form of hostile propaganda or disinformation or, you know, as you call it, heinous acts of journalism. And so states to maintain their integrity and their sovereignty in an information warfare uh, theater, they have to engage in control of information flows. 
and and that means uh, you know control of what gets posted on social media and what you find on Google and such things. And so that's that's I would say the the summary of kind of what we're getting at here. There is there is the first big class of justifications, which is these national security, um, cultural sovereignty information sovereignty issues where you if another society is able to inject um, their propaganda into your discourse, you are less sovereign as a result. Well, um, you know, information sovereignty is never is never really um, quite fully achievable for any state. Of course. Right. Um, you know, people, especially the educated classes at their best, they're always curious about other societies, other ways of thinking and so on. Um, but, you know, one way to think of it is that as human history has progressed, we've gotten better and better at communicating at scale. Um, a lot of people might have the impression that the printing press was, say, a decentralizing step in the development of human technology. Mm -hmm. But actually, I think the printing press might have been, might have arrived at a slightly inconvenient time for the church. So first, first thing to say about the printing press in China, you know, in Europe, you could say that it played a role in the Protestant Reformation. In China, the printing press did no such thing. It made civil, civil service exams slightly cheaper, right? But then even in the West, in the long run, the printing press is what enabled the standardization of language. And as we know, right. like nationalism was an extremely strong force in 19th century Europe and played a completely invaluable role in the formation of states that were much, much more powerful than any, you know, any sort of medieval polity, the amount of state capacity that, say, France of 1870 had compared to France of 1170 is, you know, 1170. There's no, there's no comparison, right? These are yeah. vastly better ability to control the population, the ability to mass conscript people, the ability to eventually levy uh, things like income taxes, which require detailed information on your citizens, um, the ability to standardize education on a national level, et cetera, et cetera. Like we can just keep on listing these criteria by every single reasonable criteria, the state versus say an individual is more powerful in the 20th century and the 19th century than it is in the 11th century. Some people even debate whether right. states existed properly in that time period or whether it's really misleading to even use that term. And the, the printing press is something you cannot skip if you're doing, you know, nationalism in the 19th century kind of democratic mass market model, right? You require people to read the same language. You require them to be literate enough to follow the directions of bureaucrats, essentially, and read their train ticket, et cetera, et cetera. Like what is a national consciousness? It's when you have a whole mass of people reading the same language, reading the same materials and thinking the same thoughts. Um, and, and that's essentially a logistical accomplishment. You need some technology to enable that logistical accomplishment. And the printing press was one of those key technologies. And, and that is fundamentally a centralizing thing because you're getting a bunch of people to be pulling from the same sources rather than this highly decentralized sort of folk culture situation that existed before that with some centralized aspects in the church. So, so my argument partially here would be that as communication technology advances, the scale of communication is just larger and larger. So more and more right. people are communicating on the same channels using the same standardized interfaces in the same language, etc. At the extreme, I don't think it'll ever quite get so far, but in the extreme, you could imagine a planet with one language and one social media network, right? And that could, yeah. that would plausibly just be even more efficient and more naturally attractive than anything right now. You know, let's, let's remember again, the reason people, no matter what MySpace does, and I presume the site still exists if it's, you know, not disconnected, uh, no one's ever going to return to it because it's, it's not Facebook. It's not Twitter. It's not TikTok. It's not where people are anymore, right? It wasn't ever about the features. It was about who's using the network and humans being yeah. social, uh, social creatures. We have a inherent desire to connect with others and communicate with others. Either it's those who are nearby, but perhaps more provocatively, I would say, yes, we do crave to connect with those 
far away. Like people actually, you know, they care about the likes. Uh, if you if you talk to someone, it's some something like thousands of strangers giving you a strange kind of social validation online. It still feels good. Uh, I have to say yeah. that does that is a little bit of a challenge for classical evo psych. I think you know it's hard to argue that in the ancestral environment we were chasing Facebook likes and uh, you know OnlyFans subscribers. <laughs> but some of their red like berries. Oh man, yeah, you're totally right. You're totally <laughs> right. Um, well, I think we've made a I think we've made a good kind of overview of the technology and especially communication technology as centralizing argument. But, but at this point, a lot of people, you know, when we talk about this kind of thing, a lot of people still are wringing their hands saying, oh, I know it's terrible. I wish we would, we need to de develop decentralized internet or it's, you know, the world is going to hell. And, and like, I guess this is, this is just how it is. It's just very pessimistic outlook on the whole thing. But, but let's flip that around. What great things can we do because of this te communication technology and especially the, the, even the centralizing and, and censorious aspects of it? Let's, let's flip it around. Let's get excited about this. There is a progress in ability to do things. Human ability has been increased by these technologies and surely there is something there to get excited about this is the thing that i want to really hit here is i i'm tired of the pessimistic attitude towards towards technological progress that that keeps getting trotted out in this stuff i think there are great things that are being enabled by better communications technologies and there are new challenges it's true that there are challenges i mean there's there's these questions of what does justice look like um, what should the law be around, you know, what you're allowed to say online and so on. And I, I think we don't have good answers to those questions yet. And maybe we should try to answer them on this podcast. But there are these questions, but there's also just this like good things being done with these technologies. And, and I think let's try to focus on that for a minute. Like let, what, what do you think is uh, the good aspect of these technologies? Because I think on net, they are good. Oh, I already said. I think I think they are actually uh, fulfilling human human desires pretty stra straightforwardly, right? Um, it's not that people are somehow being tricked into wanting to go where all the other people are. It's not that they're just envious of the other people. Uh, you know, I think the social drive, right. the desire, is to interact with the people. Sometimes compete, sometimes cooperate, um, sometimes talk. Uh, sometimes argue, right? These are all we want to be entangled with each other. I think that's one of the one of the truths of the human condition is we right. want to be entangled with each other, and we do our best to overcome right. like we, physical we and other, other barriers. We want to be friends. Exactly, exactly, and we you know we want to entangle yeah. our thinking. You know, I think this is very much in this natural course of human development that eventually we will achieve that goal. Now, the question is, what, what else will we want to do with that? Yeah, in some sense, we're building just a bigger and more unified society. I mean, there are certainly these kind of polarizing aspects to it and, uh, at the current time in history, but, but we have more access to each other than ever. We have more access to each other's ideas. There's more discourse going on, or at least more, the more potentiality for discourse than there has been. There is, and, and so there's, there is this incredible interconnection happening as a result. I think that thing, uh, you know, as you allude to, I think that's a uh, perhaps that's the big value proposition. That's the thing that's good here. There are a lot of problems that it enables us to solve. There's a lot of ignorance and you know being able to get away with certain crimes and so on. That that is kind of uh, well, we we need to develop new by the social technologies appropriate to the scale of society, right? When uh, right, and that this is where the challenges are coming from. Like, I think I think this is maybe a way to flip this around. Is the challenges that we're seeing in the polarization in in the sort of wild west kind of nobody knows what the rules are kind of censorship that we have in the the fights that are coming out of this. These are all the problems. Uh, these are in some sense, the problems of success. We have created a larger and more interconnected society. Now we're going to run into a bunch of scaling issues. Some of those being like, now that speech is so empowered, uh, suddenly we're running into this issue of, okay, well, really empowered speech actually is dangerous. 
And so we're having to think about what exactly are the limits on speech. And I, I, we've mentioned one of the big cases of the limits of speech, which is we don't really want uh, foreign governments to be able to manipulate us in a hostile manner uh, through through the injection of speech into our discourse. Um, you know, not all speech is, is neutral or positive. Some of it is actually damaging. And foreign states especially will try to take advantage of that. We've also discussed unwanted communication, such as spam, and uh, yeah. also touched briefly on, say, the problem of like on online harassment and so on. Uh, for example, yeah, which is un unwanted communication. Space. Exactly. And then there's also the question of if someone releases on a significant platform false information about you, there should be some method of redress. So I am mildly inclined towards, you know, libel laws and so on. Yeah, well, th this is. Yeah, it's I mean, we have legal mechanisms for this. I don't think I think right now part of the issue here. I mean, we, we discussed this when we talked to Robin Hansen, I think. Um, the legal system has gotten out of control expensive due to various historical reasons, um, one of which seems to be just like a, I don't know, too much class consciousness among lawyers or something. But the legal system has become sort of less accessible than it ought to be, and, and thus it's not able to solve a bunch of problems that it actually has mechanisms for, but we're having to solve those problems by other means because the legal system has become unaffordable. Yeah, I, I think in a, in, a mature, in a mature internet, if someone were, you know, a very popular user were to widely spread a provably negative thing about another private individual, uh, that private individual should have some method of re redress and there should be some yeah, I mean, way to have important. that information removed. And, you know, that might not be in the form of a lawsuit. It might be in the form of appealing to some kind of adjudication, which, by the way, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, in, in the in the company itself. It could be some other type of body uh, and the social dynamics and technology there would need to be worked out. But guess what? You know, this this stuff yeah. was worked out in previous societies in response to the technologies of their own era. Like libel laws were completely transformed by the printing press because it enabled this type of oh, communication yeah, of at scale. Uh, you know, um, pamphleteering and then eventually newspapers, right? And they had to be a balance between, between the ability to have an intact personal reputation, which is a precondition for social life, which we as established, we all pursue. Uh, I think people often, you know, they say they're afraid of the government. But I think mostly they just kind of want the ability to curate their own social presence. Like people are way more mortified right. if their friends get to read their messages than if the NSA is like perhaps scanning all their emails. Right. It's like, well, I, you know, I don't have beef with the NSA. The NSA is not going to come into my social circles and cause drama. Right. Right. So it's like, right. It's not going to try to quote mine you to, uh, to, uh, you know, estrange your friends from you. Right, right, right. Like, like the big thing I'm afraid of with the NSA is that their internal discipline breaks down, and and some like I don't know politically or or socially or psychopathically motivated person within that mm -hmm. system t takes that data in an abusive direction. But it's not the system as it's properly working that that anyone's afraid of. Right. Or I mean, some people are afraid of it because they're criminals and terrorists or whatever. But uh, but getting back to this question of what kind of challenges we're facing as a mm -hmm. result of essentially moving society onto this superior communications medium. We're seeing issues of what is proper social decorum and what are the proper ways to interact with each other. And in, in, an, in an analogous way, like if you just dropped a bunch of, you know, random uncivilized minds into a bunch of random uncivilized bodies and like threw them into society, they would probably be killing each other and, and fighting over stuff. And uh, there would be a lot of uh, what we now call law breaking, but they wouldn't have the law. And we've kind of done something analogous. We've thrown ourselves into this new environment that we don't really know how to behave in, which is this entirely speech-based communication environment. And putting so much load on that kind of environment means inevitably there is a bunch of uh, there are there are positive ways to interact and negative ways to interact and we need to develop um, law in in the broad sense of you know regulation of how we, how we interact with each other reg to, to make that 
that interaction positive, productive, and and not like extremely negative for people. You know, sometimes these these speech environments. You know, you naively you might think, oh, pure speech. It's just pure speech. You don't ha- you can't be harmed by it, so there's no problem, right? But the, actually, the actual fact is people can be harmed by it. People can be driven to suicide. People can be bullied. People can be driven out of their social circles. People can be uh, ostracized from society. There's all kinds of things that can be done there that are uh, quite negative consequences. And so we need to have these systems of regulation, which we call law, to figure out uh, what are the rules in a pure speech environment. And so this, this is kind of like an interesting way that the actual reality of the problem collides with a lot of our preconceptions from from the the meat space era, so to speak, about free speech, where where free speech was only part of society, or where speech was only part of society. We had this idea of free speech, but now that applied to a situation where speech has taken up a huge fraction uh, and and is is massively empowered in society. It's it no longer quite makes sense to have speech without constraint. Um, the same way it makes no sense to have behavior without constraint uh, in the context of uh, of the law. Well, uh, you know, important, it's first to understand where the positive case for free speech arises in the first place. Yes, yes. There is a impassioned, uh, there's an impassioned defense of free speech in On Liberty, which is, you know, I... I you know, highly recommend the work. It's very much worth reading. Uh, and in it, um, John Stuart Mill makes the very clear argument that, you know, truth is a good and people should have the ability to access the truth. And that the reason mm-hmm. we should listen out to unusual arguments, unusual points of view, even if they seem manifestly incorrect to us, is that yeah. if they are, if they are, if they happen to be correct, well, we've received a good, right? Our views are corrected. If they are incorrect, then our own counter defense to it allows us to contrast truth and non-truth, right? Allows us to con- contrast truth and falsehood, uh, thereby enhancing our understanding of the truth further, bringing it, you know, bringing it even further along. And his view was that, you know, in a free speech type of regimen, you know, the very best would rise to the top. This is an interesting yeah. set of arguments. And I think with the right set of social technologies, it's a true argument, right? You do want anything to be raisable in a philosophical discussion. You do want anything to be raisable as a scientific hypothesis to investigate. You probably don't want absolutely everything to be raisable in terms of, you know, in terms of, um, in terms of political speech or persuasive speech, because ultimately, yeah. you know, the, the reality of human history is one of, you know, infectious mass scale insanity every now and then, right? You have it, it, it has this interesting analog to the market and free market ideas. Um, so to the extent that the system behaves according to the axioms of uh, what the free market people talk about, just, you know, like it's all free exchange between rational individuals, etc., to the extent that that's actually what's going on, essentially free exchange on the market is a good thing. And yeah, there's a lot of challenges with it, but it's essentially a good thing because it has this ratcheting effect of everyone's kind of able to make their decisions. They're not harmed by the optionality and and they're just they're able to take from the market uh, and give to the market things that they want and things that other people want. But the argument kind of breaks down as the axioms of the market and the nature of the market doesn't quite apply in reality, where there are these factors within economics. And we had a great article about this from from Ian Fletcher and Mark Fasto about the economic foundations of industrial policy, a certain class of limitations of the market in practice that mean that there are other things going on that you have to take a more a more active hand in in shaping what goes on in industry. And I think likewise, you're going to have a few uh, analogous things happening in discourse where there's some ideal of rational discourse between rational agents. You know, if everyone's a philosopher, 
it's it's hard to imagine negatives to speech. You know, everyone's able to see through bad rhetoric. Everyone's able to understand uh, good arguments and refute bad arguments and so on. But the actual fact is everyone is not a philosopher. Discourse doesn't really work like that. There are these negative things that can happen in discourse, like it is in fact possible to bully someone to suicide just over just through an internet connection. This is not, you know, them being benefited by true information. It's that they it's have been possible. Given. It's possible to set a mob onto someone. Uh, right. With just yeah. misinformation, right? Right, and and right, exactly. So there's all these things where the discourse diverges from the ideal of of that ratchet of positivity, and those are the cases where it makes sense to start in introducing more control and 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 limitation, and 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 this. I mean, we all understand this, like. You know, you wouldn't, you don't allow free speech in your social circles. It's crazy. Like you, you don't. I mean, even if you, imp, you don't explicitly limit it, but like no one actually speaks freely among their friends, for example. Well, not completely freely. There are degrees of freedom, right? There's stuff that they right. um, share with their friends, and we have to be cautious with what people observe or don't observe, right? There can be for many people um, this kind of illusion of consensus. Because if something is not discussed and no one brings it up and you happen to not believe it, uh, then from your perspective, you live in the simulation where in fact, no one believes anything unusual or anything incorrect, right? There are hidden preferences that happen. Um, you know, there's this falsified preferences as well, uh, where, where people, people adhere to social norms. But like, I think your point on, on free speech has to be illustrated a little bit, right? Now to go, okay, to go to the John Stuart Mill thing, uh, he he doesn't make the case that oh you know private companies can censor but governments are not allowed to censor no he's actually making a case for free speech at all levels he's saying you as an individual yes, should be tolerant party. of uh, views of other people and listen to people who seem manifestly wrong uh, you as a publisher should be tolerant of essays you disagree with and you as a government should be tolerant of political views you disagree with. And I think taken as a whole, this makes the argument both stronger and narrower because I think the dichotomy between, you know, the public platform versus the private individual, it's, it's not obvious at all. And then on, on the personal level, having again, like the exact same two people discussing the exact same issue might discuss it in good faith over an evening over a book or they might use the exact same argument in a heated discussion and in one of these cases saying shut up is the correct move and the other one it's not right so right. whenever you tell someone to shut up uh, let alone if you're putting social sanction behind it or whenever you're choosing not to invite someone to an event because you have a disagreement or something like that. That, in fact, right there is a limitation on speech. Yeah, and 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 often a warranted one. But I think the the point you're making is that is that Mill makes the point that there are perhaps hidden benefits to being a little bit more tolerant in in our approach to speech. And so this and this to leads listening into what very importantly to tics. listening. Right, he is yes to listening yes. especially yeah and and. Um, I mean, you, you generally want to be, again, conservative in what you produce and liberal in what you consume, right? Yes. But uh, this, is, this is a classic um, principle that's applied all over the place in computer science, but also um, I'm sure it, it, it has also reached application in discussion of society as well. But this gets to this interesting tick of modern discourse around censorship, which is that it's entirely about the First Amendment in the, in the American Constitution and Congress shall pass no law, which in other words, the government is not going to limit your speech. Specifically, the federal government is not going to limit your speech. Massachusetts colony might dictate that actually you have to be a Puritan or get out of here. Uh, but that, or that's what, that's what it was like at the time. But, uh. Banned in Boston was, uh, even something that was advertised right. elsewhere in the U.S., right? Uh, there was a significant right. no, limit so, so on what kind of the books could be sold there. Has this limitation. Yeah. But, but, um, the thing is, the the issue of free speech goes way beyond the First Amendment, and and it's the focus on the First Amendment has led to this weird situation where we regard censorship as 
totally legitimate in or some people regard it or at least defend it as if it's totally legitimate and and acceptable in all cases if it's a private company or a private individual um, doing the censorship that that there should be no constraints there, there is no law that should apply to this there is no like regularity in what we should censor and not censor and and there's no responsibility to censor things in a particular way they, they apply that standard to private companies and then say it's only bad if the government does it and that's this is this really weird thing that I, th- I think is quite bizarre about American discourse. And like from my perspective, I don't know, maybe we've just been in the palladium theory bunker for too long. But but from my perspective, it's like I, I think we had a tweet about this the other day, but it was something like censorship is is OK when it's uh, done by the government. Like like this is this is the this is the thing that that. Uh, makes sense to me. It's like, if it's the government doing it, well, that's their job. Their job is to govern society, right? So it makes sense that the government would censor. But if it's some random uh, random private company doing it, I mean, these companies are not, in fact, sort of private. They are public companies uh, for whatever that means. But also they are large monopolies that, that it actually regulate a piece of the public discourse, but there's this sort of like the 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 opposite intuition could could just as easily be applied. The, the, the government definitely has the the mandate to do censorship, but these these companies, which are effectively you know infrastructure of public discourse, why do they get the right to do censorship? And so that and that's that's not necessarily you know my position here. I think I think you've put out the correct position, which is the I guess the John Stuart Mill position, which is it the rule is not about who's doing it. It's about what should be done. And uh, I think that's sort of the reasonable synthesis here. But I just want to point out that there's this sort of opposite intuition yes. that, that seems just as plausible. I strongly agree with that. And, and the concrete the concrete thing, by the way, is that uh, you know, if the government introduces limits on speech, very quickly, there would be a code of law and it would be possible to hire a lawyer to argue your case that, in fact, you right. did not violate uh, your speech laws of your country. I note that this is, in fact, possible in the European Union, right? The European Union countries, you know, they have limits right. on speech. You can actually go to court. You can go to court. You can go to court. Uh, the police, you know, they in Britain, perhaps a little dystopianly, you know, they can come knocking on your door for a tweet. You might get arrested, but then you get a lawyer. Uh, recently, Brett Weinstein, uh, you know, had the situation where his Facebook account was disabled, and the, uh, you know, what was the wording of the of the disabling that you know it, it had violated some rules, and that the decision was reviewed, and that there is no appeal. Well, uh, you know, honestly, I would have liked a Facebook lawyer in in his position. Now, he, of course, got that overturned because he has this big platform. And they claimed at least it was a mistake. But if that's a mistake, that suggests, you know, just a mistake, uh, something driven by, you know, algorithmic moderation that suggests there are thousands or tens of thousands of users who, uh, you know, without, um, without, without, uh, Brett's platform, uh, just have to right. suck it up and, you know, live life without Facebook. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I, I think the specific injustice there is, is the irregularity and unpredictability exactly. of the whole thing. Exactly. If it was predictable, if it was like, here's the rules, don't break the rules. And if you break the rules or if you're accused of breaking the rules, you get this nice due process. There are methods of redress. You're called up in some kind of, some kind of arbitration process and you are able to argue your case in front of a relatively impartial judge. And that, that is a, very well established social form, a very well established social technology for for regulating people's behavior in society. You know, it's called the law. We've been doing it for thousands of years, but in the modern era, with specifically the internet censorship, because we have these, I, I, I mean, I'm speculating here, but I think partially because of these weird legal situations with the First Amendment, the government is not actually able to step in and regulate speech because it's not within their power formally. And, and so we get this situation where we have no law and there's no regularity. There's no predictability. You don't know what you're allowed and not allowed to say, except implicitly. Sometimes people get banned and you're pretty sure they never actually said the thing. It's just because of who they associate with or who they are or 
you know, whatever. You, it's something sort of very tenuous in the connection, but you sort of see why it was done. And it's, it's the actual rationale is, is much more political or something. And, and that's a mess. When Alex, when Alex Jones, right. And, you know, of course his, uh, let's, let's call yeah. his material high variance. Um, <laughs> when Alex Jones is banned off of YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, all within a few and days, MasterCard. nominally yeah. independent organizations. He certainly, you know, he certainly thinks that, you know, the shadow government is out to get him. And in a way, he's not right. Like the people are informally friends. They hang out. They consume the same type of media. They're people from the same class. You might as well call this a government, except it happens to be an oligopoly. So when an oligopoly decides yeah. that, no, I'm sorry, you are not going to be able to transmit on the internet used by 97% of users. Well, you know, if the US government banned you from America's internet, you probably would still be able to work on Russia's internet. So why are you complaining? You can still, you know, you go to Russia, talk from Russia. I mean, again, this th this comes back to the weird limitations of specifically the U.S. Constitution. Um, Possibly, but I think I think people even make this argument in European countries, right? They would make the argument that this is different, and in some ways, look, in some ways, you know, fragmenting tasks is, but it's 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 not it's not that different, right? All the censorship arguments related to truth and to the idea that. Uh, the, the purpose of free speech is the ability to have, to be free from error enforced by power, right? So, so John Stuart Mill yeah. is like very interested in the discovery of truth and believes it's something we should all pursue. Yeah. And now, of course, we can amend these arguments by noting that, you know, human beings are rational. We sometimes act in bad faith. We sometimes uh, do all sorts of terrible things. You know, uh, you know, a mob is not interested necessarily in a reason discussion with an individual. Uh, and because of that, you know, if if the truth value is not served by the sort of free speech norm, then the free speech norm is inappropriate, right? In the private heated argument, uh, you know, the shut up thing might be quite appropriate. And in the context of, you know, demagoguery or information warfare or any of that stuff, uh, the government should be able to probably say shut up. And in fact, in fact, they do, right? The interesting question is, right. to what extent have Western governments merely adopted indirect methods of speech control and informal methods of speech control that are actually more tyrannical and growing more tyrannical over time than a simple, straightforward yeah. law would be, one with a court of appeal? Yeah. I mean, this is the thing is without law, you have, it's not like you have freedom without law. You have tyranny and, and injustice. A narco censorship. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the point I was making with the US constitution, which perhaps applies to any polity that has ideas like free speech or limited government is that because we have these limitations on what the formal government is allowed to do, which was intended to be a balance on its power against the states. The states were supposed to have those powers. But what it's turned into is that the formal government has this has these limitations in what it's allowed to do. And it's again, it's not like those powers just go away or stop existing. Rather, what happens is they end up being done by this informal shadow government aspect is what, like what you called the shadow government in the context of Alex Jones, where you have these networks of People operating NGOs, operating activist networks, operating in the press, operating in, in you know, across the, the kind of actual levers of power in society. They do, in fact, come to some kind of working consensus and they often have vaguely policy or they at least have political enemies. And if you become one of their political enemies, you're going to have a bad time. And they, they do, in fact, govern society a lot. Uh, they, that is where the governance is is happening, right? The decisions about what the future should look like, how are we going to get there from here, who has to do what. Um, these things, these powers are all actually in existence, but they're not formalized as part of the government because the government has this formal limitation on its power. And so you have this weird situation where you are in fact being governed, but you have this kind of situation where you're not allowed or you're not quite able to say that it's the government governing you and you're not quite able to talk coherently about who, who exactly is governing you and how you're being governed because it's not formalized. And, and again, like this, this comes back to the, the freedom of speech thing with are these big companies, which are effectively part of the government, 
or effectively closely related and closely aligned with the, the actual government, are they able to censor you? And I, I, I pulled up the tweet that I was mentioning earlier that I, that I don't think I did justice to. Um, the tweet was, we saw someone tweet, only the government can infringe on your freedom of speech. And we thought, gee, that sounds reasonable until we realized that it doesn't count if it's the government. So this is just kind of a humorous <laughs> way to state the state the situation. That it's like, like, well, if only the government could infringe on my freedom of speech, that sounds, hey, that sounds good. Right? That, that actually but, is an, it would be, we would experience that as an increase in actual personal lived liberty, right? Yeah, that, that would be an increase in liberty and probably an increase in justice because, you know, you'd actually be able to appeal to the government. There are systems of appeal and so on. You might actually be able to, I mean, in a democratic system, theoretically, you can you can uh, elect a different government if you don't like what they're doing. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it has to do with in the West broadly, we've told these stories about limited government, neutral government, uh, apolitical government. And that has meant that formally a lot of powers that actually exist and actually get used can't be formalized as as part of government, and which means that we can't actually apply law and justice to them. And and I think it creates messy situations when you can't do that. I mean, obviously, in the public context, like, come on, we, we're living in a pandemic, right? Do we want people loudly and publicly, you know, using, using media, using their personal platforms, uh, you know, spreading potentially harmful misinformation. Say, imagine that there was a harmful quack I mean, like treatment. The CDC. Well, like the CDC, you know, and certainly, right? I and I note that, in fact, all the major platforms followed the public health argument, and in fact, uh, you know, will now regularly uh, dethrottle, remove, demonetize YouTube videos or uh, you yeah. know, throttle tweets. That go contrary to the CDC. The problem is the CDC, you know, issued you know a public uh, you know a public announcement. I think back in March that you know masks don't work, uh, which is why yeah. they later had to introduce the public health the catchy public health campaign of your face cloth covering protects uh, protects me. My face cloth covering protects you because of course you can't use the mask. You see, it's like papal infallibility. Yeah, right, right. Once you've said masks don't help, then it's all you know. Uh, face cloth coverings. Yeah, but they, I mean, they've gone, they've, of course, of course, they have no problems going back on it as well. I mean, the, the whole thing's been a mess. I think, I think this is like the pandemic has been one of these cases where, you know, it's all nice to say, well, the government should be able to regulate speech and so on. And then you see an actual practical case of it. And it's like, oh man, we need a government. Oh, we, <laughs> let, we perhaps don't have one yet. Before we talk about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. Like, like the, the situation was so bad. It was, it was as if we didn't have a government. And well, well, what I would say is, I would say, despite the First Amendment, despite free speech ideals, all the major companies, just on the strength of the pandemic situation, decided and agreed on essentially a form of, you know, soft censorship or even hard censorship voluntarily, oh, yeah. no, unilaterally. I mean, and I, we were even discussing how it was, in fact, misused. So, if, like, from the practical perspective, you know, censorship happened. It was arguably, you know, misused or not used to top effect. Though, of course, you know, we don't actually know. Maybe there was uh, not just correct information that disagreed with the CDC that got throttled. Maybe there was, in fact, like, you know, seriously harmful informa disinformation as well that we didn't see. It looks to me like the disinformation is, is doing just fine out there. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think your point, though, is that, in fact, something that was governing us. Maybe well, it's not our society behaved as if it had limitations on speech. No, de facto, yeah, it right. behaved. No, it, it was it, fully coordinated. Right. No, it, it, we we behaved as if there was some authority that could issue a fatwa and uh, everyone would fall in line, and that that seemed to actually happen. And uh, you know, part of our issue here is just first of all the incompetence of that system. Second of all, its informality. Exactly. And I think these things perhaps are are closely related. If I were to make a positive case for when and how speech should be controlled, I would say that institutions always have an extremely difficult time maintaining epistemic competence. I wrote I wrote an article on this um, annoyance right. or Armageddon, right? The epistemic challenges for bureaucracies related to the pandemic. Unfortunately, you know, yeah. I don't think it was quite Armageddon, but it was definitely more than annoyance. Um, so the epistemic challenges of coming to correct conclusions are significant for either a clique, 
you know, a clique such as might be, you know, the public trust and safety committees at, you know, Facebook, uh, YouTube and Twitter when they go together for drinks or for, you know, vegan snacks. Uh, and Or it might be a clique such as, you know, governed older states such as an aristocracy uh, or it might be a bureaucracy. You know, cliques are predisposed to groupthink. Bureaucracies are mm-hmm. predisposed to process over substance. Because of these mm-hmm. significant difficulties, right, epistemic difficulties, I think maybe a page should be taken from the book of, you know, say, papal infallibility in the Catholic Church, which is that in the Catholic Church, the Pope only from when speaking from the throne of St. Peter on a matter of dogma uh, can really issue something that's considered a, a statement that can't be moved, right? Because they're so mm-hmm. averse to like theological error, right? Uh, and it's only been mm-hmm. invoked a few times, papal infallibility. And I think on the other side, I think we would want a system where institutions in their domain of actual epistemic excellence have a very, very narrow mandate to regulate speech. So rather than super broad mandates, I would go for relatively narrow ones. Yeah, I mean, that, that of course, brings in the issue of how do you judge the epistemic excellence of any given institution, which we got into on the podcast that we recorded yesterday. But yeah, that, that's that's itself a sticky issue. But yeah, I mean, it might be that that you want these these narrow authorities able to kind of issue expertise uh, judgments on certain issues. But these these are sort of getting into mechanisms. I think of course. Uh, I, I want to make sure that we enumerate the justifications as, as we go through this. So I, I think we've run into three justifications so far for censorship. And I think there's one remaining. So the first one, again, was the cultural informational sovereignty issue against hostile information warfare from other states. The second one is these issues of as society moves online, it becomes much more information based, much more communication based. The law of how do we interact with each other in an information space needs to be developed. And that law necessarily takes the form of limitations on what you're allowed to say to other people, simply because, you know, that is now the way we interact. And there are actually many very negative ways to interact in a speech environment. And then the third thing that I that we've mentioned a couple of times is this issue of disinformation, where we have, you know, things like I don't know, depending on your opinion of Alex Jones, we've got Alex Jones. Depending on your opinion of the CDC, we've got the CDC. We've got uh, certainly many conspiracy theories and, and, and weird ideas out there flying around. And generally, so to flesh out that argument a little bit, which I think has been underdeveloped so far for us here, is like, let's say you're governing the discourse. There are discourses you want, sub-discourses you want to have that you regard as Productive. There are other sub-discourses that are unproductive. Perhaps they lower public trust or they they actually just create error or otherwise are, are creating some problem. Um, or maybe they're just gathering up a lot of attention and, and you don't want people to be paying attention to that because it's useless. Um, like, for example, on that grounds, you might shut down the New York Times or, or other. Well, the New, York, of, the New York Times, know, the New York Times you, is just a blog. Whatever you regard to be at the root of, right. No, but but whatever whatever it is you regard to be at the root of like a highly distracting, polarized culture where everyone's like wasting their time worrying about politics. But there are these various aspects of society's discourse, and you may want to boost some and, and de-boost others. And that's generally kind of the problem of, first of all, disinformation, but also just general gardening of the discourse in strategically useful directions for society. And so that would be, I would say, the third aspect or the third sort of reasonable justification for censorship. Now, this obviously all is in the context of the incredible value of having free speech to the extent that we actually have a real discourse and and the ability for people to talk to each other about their weird ideas is actually very important to society and and that must be sort of taken before we start talking about the justifications for uh, limitation on on discourse. But those are the the three big justificational arguments that I've heard so far in this discussion. If we have anything more to say about those, we can. Otherwise, I have another one that I would like to discuss as well. Right, right. I mean, the key the key interesting thing here is that 
anyone who has had experience with an unmoderated forum in the early 2000s versus a moderated right. forum preferred the tightly knit communities of a you know pseudonymous moderated forum to the wild anonymous internet it's only after the yeah. tightly knit moderated forums were replaced by social media with like an algorithmically driven uh, attention prioritization that people started you know being really into the like you know very an an anonymous platforms uh, and yeah. even those are arguably kind of have died over time so what i would say is like you know good discussion requires moderation right and moderation needs to be done by trusted authorities with with actual stake or actual, actual stakes in the outcome of the discussion the, the issue with everyone moving to these big algorithmically moderated social media systems is that it's the centralization and the homogenization right like on these old forums you'd have things you know you'd be discussing some really niche topic that maybe other people don't want to hear discussed or don't want to discuss or whatever it's just some weird thing you're discussing it with a hundred other weird internet people and then you know someone says something stupid and gets banned and everyone cheers and you know the mods are glorious golden gods for banning this person because like people appreciate kind of the 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 local governance of that particular discussion so that they're able to have a better discussion about that topic. But when you move to these giant social media platforms, what you get is either the, because the moderation is somehow centralized and, and there it becomes very blunt. It's either it, it tends to be basically a limitation on what you're allowed to discuss. And so you can't, it becomes harder to find these niche conversations that are really free flowing and at the same time the discussions that are being had are very unmoderated because the only the only form of moderation available has become this like very centralized homogenized form of moderation and i mean to some extent platforms like reddit try to solve this with with you know local moderators and local discussion forums and it works to some extent but i think you see similar things there where a lot of the let's say the imperatives of homogenizing global censorship tend to override a lot of what you, they tend to override a lot of the local concerns. And, and so you, the effect is the same, that you end up with a relatively homogenized internet with relatively bad moderation. And that's, that's sort of a, an interesting aspect of, of the whole governing and sort of gardening the, the information landscape uh, situation. So I, I'll give my fourth, my fourth uh, what I regard to be a justification for censorship. This is perhaps the most controversial one, and it's the general idea of political order. So generally in societies, there is some political order, by which we mean there is a power structure. There is the question of who is subordinate to who, who's in charge, who are the in crowd, who is the out crowd. Um, who's actually governing, etc. And this, this forms the political order. And overturning the political order is always a very messy affair. If some other faction comes up and overturns the political order, it usually creates an incredible mess. Um, often a civil war, often a revolution, often a lot of people die um, or, or a lot of stuff gets broken. And so political order disruptions are, broadly speaking, not appreciated in society. And also, more specifically, the powers that be obviously don't want to be overthrown. So they will often uh, go to significant lengths to maintain their political order against challengers and uh, that, that are threatening them politically. And I think especially in a society with hyper-empowered speech, as we're kind of getting into now, a lot of the challenges to authority take the form of speech on the internet. And therefore, a lot of the response, the response from the sort of political order justification is going to be taking the form of censorship of speech on the internet for political reasons. Like, essentially, there is some entrenched elite that don't want you to uh, politically go after them and they are going to censor your speech on the internet uh, so that you don't, uh, so that you are less empowered against them. And this is, I think, 
at the very least, it's something quite natural in the sense that you can't really get rid of it. There's always someone at the top of society. They have a lot of power. They often have a lot of informal power. They're thus able to do what they feel they need to do, including censor you. And so this is, I think, one of the reasons that censorship gets deployed. And I don't think it's necessarily a bad reason, because as I said, disruptions in political order are a mess. So this is, I think, something that's going on in censorship that we really don't want to talk about in the West. Like, first of all, there's all these other dimensions of regulating speech that are perhaps outside the scope of a formally neutral and formally free speech respecting government. But where where we get really messy is where the government is formally apolitical and formally democratic, but in reality controlled by a particular elite. Um, and and so it's very difficult to formalize that aspect of censorship. But I think it's something that is definitely worth talking about and perhaps even considering the legitimacy of. Samo, do you have thoughts on that general problem, the, the political order uh, aspect to censorship? I basically think that ideally the government is structured so well that speech acts can't possibly get in its way. So it allows as many as possible for the sake of error correction, for the sake of the whistleblower, for the sake of raising the alarm, for the sake of pointing out things that are incorrect, right? Um, I think right. that is very important, right? Yeah, because you want to be in that case. Of course, like, again, um, what we call government is actually this strange emergent phenomena. Like one of my claims would be that, you know, when we decide to call something government or non or not government, Right, we call something an NGO, or we call something a company, or we call something right. a department. Uh, we're only changing the reality of what that thing is in the margin, right? So I think there's something really overdetermined about the structure of coordination of society, but we can build right. it with many different social technologies. However, as long as the end state is a coordinated mm -hmm. state, then that is a society that has governance that is governed. Right. So even even if it formally doesn't exactly ever exactly. So I think it's extremely important to have r very narrow patterns of deferral where you know trust is not invoked too often because trust is so precious. So if you are sort of like you know right. trust me, you know there is no plutonium in your sandwich, right? Like this, you know, I'm I'm happy mm -hmm. to have the government invoke that once, but if it's issuing yearly denials that there's plutonium in the sandwiches, uh, you know, I, I might start I might start eating salad, <laughs> uh, and I think I think everyone right, yeah, you you start to wonder why they have to deny it exactly, exactly, and and the the point here being is super super general, like you know, I think we trust but verify is an extremely useful um, stance. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the stance we should deploy towards institutions that compose uh, government, these organizations, these things that naturally arise, uh, you know, the FBI, the IRS, the CIA, the NASA, uh, the Department of Energy, the White House, um, you know, the post office, possibly the Federal Reserve, possibly. Is that government? Is that not government? I think that's, you know, mm -hmm. the question of is it government or not government is the less important one. The more important one is how are these right. interacting with each other? And I think something is very underrated. Um, I think free speech should perhaps be encouraged so that governments, so that the different parts of government can communicate with each other cleanly. If you only can communicate through right. proper channels, Perhaps there's a lot of information left on the table that doesn't make its way from the State Department to the Pentagon, right? Sometimes, you know, right. even though they're, you know, theoretically in the same city, uh, news might travel from the State Department to the Pentagon and vice versa, fastest via CNN. Yeah, or the New York Times, which is theoretically in a different and, city. And, and in China, in fact, you know, if you read the core party newspapers, you could be any of the several million members of the Chinese Communist Party, you can be broadly confident that the newspaper is informing you of policy. And if you go, you know, read, uh, you know, read CNN's reporting on a country, a non-US country, you can be fairly certain that the perspective of CNN will tend to reflect the perspective of the State Department. It's only a question of like, what are public channels for? And what kind of error correction should we allow in public channels? And I think it's overdetermined 
that we want at least part of the citizenry engaged and sharing their work verifiably, right? So it's sort of like, you know, should we have a bunch of the parts of the source code of society open for review and open for comments? Again, yes. with some moderation, the obvious answer is yes. Uh, but I think we should approach this from the epistemic question, right? Is this truthful with the assumption that truth is good and that truth enables us to build the most functional versions of institutions possible, right? So every time we should look at the details yeah. of the situation rather than try to over apply a moralizing or sort of a narrow minded blind stance, right? You know, um, and so in a way I, in the ideal society, or not even ideal, like honestly, in a more functional version of our own society. In slightly more functional. Yeah, in a slightly more functional version of our own society, there would be far less need to regulate speech because the negative speech would do less damage and there would be fewer negative things to say about our core institutions and about core social issues. Right. Yeah. And I mean, there's all these questions of what actual social technologies would you need of course. to get to that situation like how, how do we have to improve our public institutions and our power structures so that they are less harmed by speech um and that this is actually an interesting way of just turning the whole question around mm -hmm. it's not like oh we have to allow more speech it's rather let's harden our power structures against speech and, or against against sort of what might be harmful speech and so that we can say more and this is an interesting like a totally different take from the usual take on censorship and free speech and so on, which is just we want more of it, especially when it harms uh, the power right. structure. Um, but we're saying actually, no, one of the limitations on spe like speech is actually very important to society, um, but it's harmful to the extent that it harms the power structure. We have to harden the power structure so that it is not as harmed by speech so that we can allow more free speech. Um, it's, it's an interesting way of inverting the logic. Again, I think we shouldn't underestimate the amount to which institutions will, upon learning more about themselves, reform their practices. I'm quite sure that, right. you know, in the golden age of journalism, uh, reports on, say, you know, again, you know, reports on the FBI or on the White House or whatever, that's always like a two-sided relationship, right? Someone was doing the leaking and someone else was doing the publishing. So whoever was doing the leaking was from the institution in question, usually has some ulterior motive. But I'm certain that there were, you know, reports that uh, when read by either the leadership or a key talent at these organizations was very happy to have read that article, very upset at what had happened to the organization that they worked for and they then worked very hard to reform it uh, reform the organization from the right. inside so what you're saying what you're saying is we need a good proper party newspaper for the American state that is able to uh, penetrate these issues productively. well well, well the, you know it, it should be it should be a critical it should be a critical newspaper it right. should be a critical newspaper yeah yeah <laughs> but basically that the, the role of the role of journalism is of course there is this critical role to it I think we currently kind of take too much of an anarchistic framing on journalism that it's supposed to challenge the powerful or whatever. Um, I think there's an alternate framing where, no, the the newspaper should be the mouthpiece of sovereignty against local corruption and so on. And that, that's sort of, again, another way of flipping these things around. Yeah, I mean, I, I just dream of, of uh, American media that, that proudly flies the banner of American state-affiliated media. I mean, you know, it's it's always an interesting question like you know if uh i certainly i certainly feel that you know i would i would trust i would trust like you know estonian estonian state media estonia state affiliated media right um and i think having the us government be a trustworthy government might perhaps involve a bit of growing up to be done both on the government side and yes, on the citizenship lots. side, right? Like, yes, exactly. I think, I think the government has not always been that trustworthy in the last 70 or 80 years, right? There were in fact abuses of trust of the citizenry and Quite the citizens themselves were at times like, you know, greatly negligent of their duties. Now, to be fair, 
the duties of a citizen as outlined by this system just probably can't be fulfilled. They're probably way too demanding for a realistic system to work on its basis. Right, that everyone's supposed to educate themselves about the issues and be able to vote intelligently. I mean, et cetera, et cetera. I, you know, I've dedicated a lot of my life to trying to, you know, think about trying to think about history, politics, social technology, some of these epistemic questions, uh, created companies, written articles, etc. I do not yet feel uh, worthy to really comment on some of the most practical policy issues of our day. Uh, so how right. how in the world, you know, how in the world can we just do this in aggregate over and over and over again? I think that I think that it's kind of impossible, so we have a sham version of it. But still, even having said all of this, I think I think perhaps if US citizens and you know this also applies to citizens of other western countries i don't want to necessarily pick on the us it's just that honestly you know the us is the most important western country by far right it's the most important one the most interesting one certainly the most dynamic one by far but if the citizens were more trustworthy you know maybe the government would trust them more no i think this is a key idea like we do have duties as citizens to be to be good citizens, not just as uh, within the sort of ideal of holding the government to account, but also in the ideal of uh, cooperating enthusiastically with the legitimate aims of government. Right, right. And again, like, you know, the, uh, I think a lot of the social technologies for the modern era remains to be invented. I don't think America should yes. adopt the Chinese model. In fact, if you look at the Chinese no. model, it's obviously a 20th century model. It's what? It's a party state that tries to control newspapers. That's the first hint. Why are they trying to control the editors? If they were in fact this, you know, panopticon digital surveillance state, uh, they would instead, you know, they would instead try to control social media platforms. It doesn't, you know, if a, if a newspaper publishes, uh, you know, leaks some emails, but no one reads the newspaper, you know, did the emails even leak, right? In a political sense, arguably no. Uh, so, you know, I think if, if this was a digital state, they would allow all speech, but would throttle or dethrottle uh, the speech that they found useful or less useful. And it would actually work as a better system of quote unquote digital totalitarianism. Like I think China is just a 20th century state that's running really well. Uh, most of the other 20th century states have kind of you know collapsed like the Soviet Union or are in various states of disrepair like the United States. Uh, and they are outperforming everyone else, not because they're so brilliant, not because they're so adapted to the future, but because, you know, their machinery, their revolution was the most recent. Well, and and they they made a few very wise strategic moves in not going down certain false paths that are. They were smart about trade, avoidable. certainly. They were smart about development, right? Yeah, they, they've they've made they've made. Uh, the right bets within the modern paradigm. So it's, it's like within within the modern paradigm, there are, there are all these different options, uh, and then there are the established best practices. And China has really killed it on just adopting what are the best practices within the paradigm, but of course retaining the very serious uh, fundamental issues of the paradigm itself. And yeah, anyways, I think I think that's a little bit off topic um, and we're out of time. So maybe that'll be next time. We've discussed a lot about why the Internet is centralizing, why it tends to be a surveillance technology and a control technology, how that seems to be increasing over time and leads to all these questions about what does the digitally enabled society look like? And how do we regulate these vast new powers that we have? And, and how do we solve these ch new challenges that we have by moving society into this superior medium of communication? We've identified, I identified, or I'm, I'm not sure, Samo, whether you fully agree with my uh, characterization here, but I think there's these four sort of good reasons for uh, censorship within, of course, the caveats that we want the government to be to not have to use them and and to restrain itself from using them on the grounds of the productivity of free speech. But they are the sovereignty issue against disinformation and uh, hostile propaganda from foreign states, the issue of how to regulate interpersonal behavior, how we treat each other 
in online and in a, in a sort of pure speech medium. Uh, there's the issue of disinformation and more broadly, the governance of the public conversation, the moderation of the public conversation towards productivity and usefulness. And, um, and fourth, the issue of political order, which is to say, making sure that the power structure is not harmed by what's going on in public speech. And so these, these are kind of four grounds for, for um, regulation of public speech that we can kind of chew on going forward. We'll think more about what the proper way to regulate internet speech is, what the legal regime should look like. These are important questions for us to figure out as a society as we go into this modern era. So with that, um, I guess we can wrap up. So Samuel, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was great to have you. Uh, your insights are always appreciated. Uh, thank you for having me. It was a wonderful discussion. Great. All right. We'll see you all next time.